Welcome to Law Subscribed. This is your dedicated news source for all things subscriptions and the law. My name is Matthew Kerbis. I'm the subscription attorney, and I believe subscriptions can help bridge the access to justice gap and incentivize attorneys to modernize and scale their practice like never before. In this episode, I interview Sahil Malhotra. Sahil is a solo practice intellectual property attorney and founder of Drishti Law. There's a special meaning behind his firm name, and you'll need to listen to the whole episode to find out what it is. I really enjoyed speaking with him because he's a true solo attorney like me and is not afraid to adapt as he goes with his practice. And he was able to intuit some of the important lessons of having a subscription business because, of course, he uses the subscription model. Thank you to my sponsors, 650 and Gavel. Links to both in the show notes and more on them later. Make sure you use the code LAWSUBSCRIBE subscribed when signing up with either of them. This is your last chance to sign up for my waitlist for my subscription seminar at subscriptionseminar.com. Details are coming very soon, and thank you for your patience to those who have already signed up. I built this seminar from scratch. It's a nuts and bolts how to start a subscription model for your firm. I'm very involved in helping each firm or attorney do that as part of the program. Since this podcast is finally getting some traction, please rate it, review it on whichever podcast app you use, share it with others you think would enjoy the show. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only, and nothing said is legal, ethical, or financial advice. Without further delay, here's the episode. Sahil Molhotra, welcome to Law Subscribe. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you so much, Matt. Happy to be here. All right. Well, go ahead. We've had a chance to talk before our interview today, but go ahead and introduce yourself to my listeners. So my name is Sahil Malhotra. I am an intellectual property attorney. I graduated law school in 2020 during a very interesting time. And I've been practicing as a solo since fall of 2021. I, I it's this is My practice is a continuation of me being a student attorney at University of Illinois, Chicago, John Marshall, where I did the trademark clinic for two years, providing pro bono services to small business owners, startups, creatives, you know, people who didn't have that many resources to be able to get those kind of services. You know, IP attorneys are not cheap. Mm-hmm. And this is basically a continuance of that. You know, I graduated law school. The opportunities weren't necessarily there for me. We had to move across the country. And because of the lack of the opportunities, I ended up in some, certain, some jobs, you know, here and there, did like a few consultant deep, so consultancy positions, temporary based. And I hated it so much, I decided to quit because I knew what I could deliver. I knew what services I could provide. I was confident in them. I was able to deliver them at, in law school. I was like, you know what? I'll just hang up my own shingle and like, you know, just get it going. It's been quite a journey since 2021. I know I'm not going to say it's it's like you just open up a store and you put up a board and people just show <laughs> up to your to, to your firm. But uh, But I've learned a lot along the way. And so far, 2023 has been really good to me. Good, good. Well, well, since we first met, which I should give a little bit of a background on that is I, I engage in mentorship. I received a lot of mentorship as a mentee when I was a law student and when I was a young lawyer. And so now one of the ways that I pay it forward is I mentor through all sorts of different organizations, one of them being the Chicago Bar and one of and my current mentee through the CBA, you went to law school with her. And so, yeah. so you know, it's if, if anyone out there had any hesitancy about like, I don't get anything from being a mentor. Well, you can get a podcast guest. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, that was amazing. I, I, and I think Stephanie's the one, Stephanie DeContenco, yeah. she's the one who told you about my motto. And, you know, which is funny, uh, Stephanie and I met at INTA last year. Well, we caught up at INTA last year. INTA is International Trademark Association. It's an annual meeting that happens. And last year it happened to be in D.C. Mm-hmm. And I went to that conference and uh, they were, for the first day, they were having an event for like the rookies who were attending for the first time this conference. And they set up different teams where you were doing like these fun little quizzes, kind of like team bonding type of a deal, because all these attorneys from all over the world that are there. Well, two teams happened to win that quiz. And I was in one team and Stephanie was in the other team. And it was just so funny. We didn't realize we were at the conference. We met up. That's where I kind of, you know, even told her about the reason why you reached out to me. Right, right. And and because there are so like when somebody hears about oh, an attorney using the subscription model, you know, there's not many of us yet. I mean, that's what I'm trying to change with the podcast. Yeah. And 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 at, at ABA Tech Show, one of the companies there, Fidu, I had the founder of Fidu, was the first guest on my podcast, Kim Bennett. You know, she had data that said that there are there are eight percent of attorneys who are interested interested in using the subscription model. That doesn't mean they're using it, but they're interested. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, so the 1.3, I'm assuming that's U.S. lawyers, 1.3 million lawyers. You know, 
what's 8% of that? It's actually qu quite a few attorneys are interested in it. So of yeah. us, you know, the, the, you know, it was, it was, it just, it made sense to, to connect and to see how you're using it because when you got started, I mean, there was, there's some stuff like, like there were a few articles out there, maybe of some law firms using the subscription model, but like, what was your, like, how did you come to it? Like, how did you decide? And you're not just doing, maybe talk a little bit about some of the other offerings, you know, that, that you have, but how did you come to the subscription model specifically? You know, you're talking about 8% uh, of people who might be interested in offering these services. Well, let me give you another number. I think around 2% of all attorneys in the U.S. are South Asian. So I don't know you, how many even South Asian attorneys are doing the subscription model. <laughs> <laughs> but but in general, I mean, it's something that I saw, you know, randomly when you're doing competitor research, when you're starting a business. I want to see how people are offering their services. You know, I went to law school, but I didn't really take any classes which taught me how to start a law firm, you know, or do billable hours. We, I think, had one hour seminar on something, how to do uh, understanding billable hours. But, you know, I, at first I just tried to like read a, like, just look at almost anything. There are clear reports where I would look at how attorneys are pricing themselves in different fields. But then I saw the subscription model and, you know, like, People are not that willing to just drop two, three, five, six thousand dollars of like a retainer fee on you. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't see the value of having like I, 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 at least I saw this hesitancy in like a lot of people wanted to just give you that big chunk of money up front. But what they did see value in is, OK, I'm going to talk to you maybe once or twice this month. How much does that cost me? You know, and. If that's not going to cost you two to three thousand dollars, you can provide the subscription model, but provide the same services that you're that you're going to provide over the course of three, four, five, six months, but on a lower cost basis. It was more flexible for the uh, it was more flexible for the client, and you know it was able it, it provided them this like flexibility if they wanted to like you know let's say they're deciding to move forward with somebody else well they used one one month of advice from you and they want to go move on to somebody else it's giving flexibility to me giving flexibility to them but uh, i think i came across it by looking at all these different services especially this one like business attorney who was offering like a three tiered you know annual like and i looked at all the different breakdowns that there were you know we're all trying to build a product in that sense, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of it just does seem like puffery, not to use, use like a leader term over here, <laughs> but like, because I'm doing all these consultations anyways, but I guess I can just add this on as like a service and show people that you're getting this value out of it. But but I think I, this one specific business attorney, I can't remember the name of the firm uh, who was offering the service. And it was like a tiered system starting from like 500, 800, 1200 a month. You know, and I was like, I don't know if I can offer that level of a service. Someone's just graduated in 2020. You know, I can offer something of like equivalency. Now, I, I think Matt, what's your what's your subscription service rate right now? So, so, so I I've taken like a super access to justice approach. Like you already mentioned, accessible pricing for legal services, right? So, like you came at it from a similar angle as me. But since I'm not an IP attorney, which by the way, I was just, I'm just reminded I met with a a legitimate web three company that's doing something on the blockchain that just got accepted into an accelerator program that I maybe need to introduce you to. I just sent, I just sent them to a VC attorney because they're going to be you know, raising venture capital, but uh, they also need IP protection at an affordable rate. So, uh, so I, I, I got to send it to you. Yeah. I, I would I, love that. Who, who knew like going to podcasts gets you a little bit of referrals? I, I, cause I, I just, you know, top of mind, right. Yeah. It's about being top of mind. And, yeah. and so I, they, they had just asked me, do you know an affordable IP attorney who could help with like the IP stuff? And I wasn't, you weren't top of mind yet, but we had this podcast booked and yeah. boom, top of mind again. So I already made my notes to, to refer you, but, but I'm taking like a super access to justice approach. And that's why I get a lot of inbound. And, and so, but, but I have a state practice. So I need mm -hmm. some kind of nexus with the state of Illinois in order mm -hmm. for me to provide legal services. And my pricing starts at $20 a month. And so this Web3 company, which is already a C Corp in Delaware, you know, is going to be operating everywhere. But they haven't like they I, like they're sort of soft launched right now. And so since they don't have a nexus with Illinois, I'm at least I'm uncomfortable providing those types of, of like fractional general counsel services to them at least in the traditional the way you hire a lawyer. It's a different thing if you they were to give me equity and I would be like a part-time employee and like yeah. then, but then I wouldn't, 
you know, be, it'd be a little bit of a different relationship. You'd have to get employed lawyer's insurance. Being an attorney is difficult. If anyone's listening to this and they're thinking about becoming an attorney, you know, it's, it's complicated right now. It is, it is very complicated. And like, you know, I know we all make jokes whenever we see people going to like, or thinking about going to law school. And like, I see people on Twitter just like, no, don't go, don't go. Or like people yelling on like campus visits or whatever. Don't go, don't do it. It's a mistake. I kind of disagree. You know, if anything, going to law school gave me a whole new perspective of what I could do with my life. Because I currently don't even see myself as just an attorney because you and I are business owners. You know, mm -hmm. we're not just attorneys. 80% of the time, we're not even doing legal work. We're doing things like this, where we're talking to other attorneys. We're doing competitive, we're doing research. We're a marketing department. We're accounting department. We're all these different, we're playing all these different roles. So yeah, being an attorney and especially being an attorney by yourself it is a little bit scary, but there is so much opportunity. Like when you just talked about like Web3, I, I was in LA last week where we attend, I attended like this whole symposium and the whole conversation was about copyright law and AI. Mm -hmm. And it's this thing with like AI where, you know, I feel like people have this fear that AI is going to replace lawyers or AI is going to replace doctors or whatever, which I very much disagree with. It's not going to replace anybody. But what is going to happen is like people who use AI are going to be better lawyers versus mm -hmm. people who don't use AI. You know, so I think what we're doing similarly with the subscription model here is we're trying to find different creative ways of providing solutions for our clients. Because in the end, like it is about that. It is about like someone calling you and they have an issue. We became lawyers because we like problem solving. You know, we... We like getting to the resolution of a matter. And if I'm able to provide that, where you're saying access to justice. Now, I'm not going to do like, you know, a thousand dollar a month subscription because, you know, maybe I also don't think I'm getting, I'm targeting that kind of client. Mm -hmm. I am still kind of working in that zone of where I was in law school, where I was working with most startups and people who are kind of like, they're penny pinchers at that, at that time, which most business owners when they're starting out are. So the subscription model really gives us an opportunity to provide those legal services that we want to for these clients, but on a more flex in a more flexible manner for our client and for ourselves as well. So we don't overstretch ourselves, and then we also don't like underperform. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you brought up, so long time listeners will have heard an episode from the, the Blue Jay, which is a, a legal AI software provider, the, their CEO and one of their innovators and, and a co-author of an upcoming book. Actually, at the time this episode released, the book will also be available. But we had that, that very same conversation because they're an AI company for lawyers. And the billable hour model, just you can't make as much money when you're super efficient with AI, when AI is giving you legal superpowers. So that you, know, that you and other attorneys like us are using the subscription model will better help us adapt to that and that's aside from all the copyright issues with AI, which at the time of recording, I think the U.S. Copyright Office actually just released a supplemental opinion saying yeah. actually under certain circumstances, you can have copyright protection if you mm -hmm. use AI, right? So, yeah. so it's changing. It must be exciting to be an IP attorney right now, uh, in other words, right? Exciting and very confusing. And with like, I mean, I think like you just said, being an attorney is very confusing right now. But being an IP attorney is also confusing because, you know, like, I'm not going to sit here and say I completely understand NFTs and Web3 or anything, but you know, I get the surface level, I get the surface level understanding of what is the IP in it and how to protect it. Right. 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 And then, and then beyond that, like, you know, I, I'm, I didn't go, when I was in law school, people weren't talking about, like, I wasn't in the circles talking about NFTs, and Web3, but you have to adapt. You have to learn about these things because it's a part of your industry. Same thing mm -hmm. with AI. You know, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I attended that copyright symposium because they were exclusively talking about AI. And there's this whole, you know, so the, there was somebody actually at that symposium from the U.S. Copyright Office. And the day that, you know, decision by the U.S. Copyright Office came down, and that was kind of the thing that we're going to more on focus on declaring what parts of your creation are inspired by AI. And I'm sure at some point it's going to be a rule where if if substantial part of your creation was not by AI, it's fine. We'll let you have some protection. That's probably what the rule is going to end up being. At least that's my outlook right. on it. Right. But yeah, you know, we're not going to be able to stop people from using AI. I mean, AI has a lot of benefits, especially with people who, with ADHD doing remedial tasks. 
like scheduling, like little emails, things like that. Yeah, it helps a lot. Yeah, yeah. And 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 it is curious, right? And like we've, I had this conversation on LinkedIn, which is my social media of choice, although we'll be getting into your content creation in a moment. But but one of the things with the first decision by the U.S. Copyright Office is it's like, is do, are they implicitly saying AI is alive? Like a thinking thing because monkeys and animals like the monkey case with taking the photograph like yeah. that's what they, that's what they they analogized it to which i think makes sense but then you're saying well ai is its own separate thinking thing right yeah. but if it's just a tool if it's just technology then it's like using a stencil or it's like using photoshop right so like yes. where like where does it fall and i think it is somewhere in between that right so yeah you know actually that was the focus on it too and someone used the analogy of like think of it in a time where we didn't used to think photography was an actual skill, you know, which is ludicrous because photography is a skill when you do like, you know, when there's like a skillful photographer behind a photograph. Right. So in this scenario where like someone was showing this like AI model where like it was a text to image, there are some that are insanely good. So good. So I do understand when you're when you're hesitant to have something protected, which is not created by a human. But I think what you're forgetting is the input that's going in there mm-hmm. is the input substantial enough right. for the output to be so dictated by the human user of the AI tool, should it be protected? That was right. basically what they were trying to say, mm-hmm. even in that scenario. And that's what I think should be the model going forward for that is if there is significant input, because if I'm just saying, give me a photo of a bulldog, no. I don't think that should be protected because that AI is taking way too many chances. Where is the bulldog sitting? Is the bulldog brown, black, white? Is the bulldog like smiling, eating something, not eating something? Riding a dragon, you know, spit yeah. while the bulldog is spitting fire. You know? Yeah. You have to be specific. So if you're going to become more specific with your input, sure, we're going to give protection to like AI created information. We yeah. were already doing it. You know, there's AI in your Gmail right now that is helping you complete your emails. Right. Right, right. And I love the AI talk, but this isn't law AI. This is no, law subscribe. No, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Well, so so getting getting back on track with the with the subscription model. So you 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 discovered it, you started using it. It it gives you predictability and income going back to what you were saying. We're business owners, so we're not just mm-hmm. practicing law, we're running a business and having predictable recurring revenue is a really important part of running that business and putting it a little bit on autopilot so that we could focus on other things. So we're we don't have to be billing time in order to make money. So what has your experience been so far using the subscription model? What would have you what would have been some takeaways, some things maybe you wish you would have known when you first started your your first version of it? You know, when I first started it, I think the first version of it was overpriced, I think. You know, it's it's the same thing. I think I'm I was learning that people had like a sticker shock. And then also people want a lot more details. Like people want value in what they're paying for. Like, okay, I'm gonna give you four hundred dollars a month, but like what am I what am I getting from it? I think initially when I used to try to explain it to people, it was very it was new for them as well. You know, it's new for a lot of attorneys to hear that you're doing a subscription model, but it, it's very new for a lot of clients to hear, oh, I can do like it's like Netflix, you know, like I can just subscribe to your law firm. It's like, yeah, you can have continuous representation at a minimal cost. But in the grand scheme of things, you're still going to be paying probably the same amount for like, let's say if your matter is going to take six months, you're probably going to pay for what that six months of work costs. It's just you're not paying a lump sum immediately because I understand that you might not just have, you might not be like a local mogul who just has $20,000 to give me on a retainer. You know, so the initial, initially, I think it was, you know, overpriced, you know, I needed to be more specific in the kind of offerings I was giving people. And then also just coming up with a better sales pitch on how to, you know, and make the consumer understand what I am offering. So far, you know, it's not necessarily a moneymaker, but it is something that like a few of my clients enjoy having because they don't, like I said, they don't want to do this like huge lump sum from the get go. And if they're if the matter's done, they don't want to continue paying for a lawyer when they're not really using them. Right, right. So you are still because you're still just doing flat fee work, right? Mm-hmm. And and are are you still on occasion using the billable hour? You know, I am only for very specific. Like I think only one of my clients is doing billable hours right now, and that's only because I I, I trust that client. You know, but most of my work. 
I mean, ninety nine percent of my work is flat fee based. Yeah, and it's a, you, uh, go so, ahead. So, so let me let me ask: Have you considered? Because I, I want to get into like how you've set up your subscription. Because one of the ways that people that I've seen attorneys use it, one of the ways I recommend is if you're already doing flat fee work, it's easy to say, "Hey, pay a certain amount a month, and you get a discount on your flat fee work." So, have you tried that? Have you thought about that? So the issue with that is because most of my work is related to trademarks and copyrights. And if someone is coming to me for a trademark application, I can't necessarily, I, I don't find, and I don't know any other attorney who does this, who files before getting the full amount paid, mm -hmm. you know, and a flat fee. Now, depending on what size firm you're going, a firm will charge someone $2,500 for a trademark application up to $5,000 for an application. But then there are also, you know, there's a lot of people like, Gerben Law Firm, very popular uh, trademark attorneys. And then Eric Pelton as well. Both of them offer very two different kind of like business models, but they offer reasonable prices for flat fee services. And that's where I would land, you know, like my pricing for flat fee services. And I don't think for a trademark application, the model of, you know, $100 a month works because I'm going to end up waiting six, seven months before a client is able to pay off what right. is owed from a legal service to register my application. Also something like a trademark application. Now there's a 10 month wait on when your application is filed to when someone at the USPTO sees it. That's a, that's at least minimum 10 to 12 month relationship that I'm going to have with that client. Now there is an idea of where, you know, a subscription model can be beneficial to someone if there's a substantive office action against your application. I don't want to get into the weeds of what a trademark application process looks like, but there are ways, there are scenarios where I've explored, okay, you know, someone doesn't want to pay. Let's say we have a TTAB, Trademark Trial and Appeal Board case happening. In that scenario, I can see a subscription model working because basically we're going to litigation. Now, again, the same scenario where someone doesn't want to pay Two, three, five thousand dollars just to upfront retainer to start this. I can I can be like, hey, we got six months until we gotta do something. We can get the subscription model going here. You're basically gonna be paying the same amount anyways. Let's get you in onto tier one of the subscription model. Yeah. When I went solo, I pivoted from mostly litigation to a transactional only practice. I did not have a database of documents to automate. That's why a business and employment legal document database and automation tool like 650 is super useful. I can rely on the quality of the documents in 650's database since they're putting excellent legal minds to work curating and updating their documents and automations over time. When you're not billing by the hour, outsourcing and efficiency matters and 650 can help you scale your practice to get high quality documents drafted in less time. Use the code law subscribed at 650.com and would be an onboarded to get 10% off. If you're not a business and employment attorney, or you have your own documents that you'd prefer to use, then my next sponsor, Gavel, is the automation tool for you. Gavel allows you to build shareable, client-facing workflow and document automations. In other words, Gavel helps you create a legal practice where attorneys can monetize the value they bring clients in productized form at scale via subscriptions and flat fees. Use the code law subscribed at gavel.io to get 10% off an annual subscription. There's no one right way to automate and scale your practice, but with one or both of my sponsors, 650 and Gavel, you can take your subscription law firm to the next level. Links to both in the show notes. Now back to the show. I mean, what, what about something like, and, you know, forgive my lack of knowledge with, with inter you know, IP, actual like registration and filings, right? Because I, I know, I know what you know, what you learn in law school about IP that you have to learn, but, but, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, there, there's a search period, right? So you're doing a search mm -hmm. with them, you know, strategy, mm -hmm. like what if, what if the name that they wanted, you know, yeah. it doesn't work. So like, and, and then, and then after they, after they get the mark. Or, or while it's pending, I don't, I don't know how it works with having to defend something while it's pending, you know, cease and desist letters, right? Like, so, mm -hmm. so like, so there, I, I feel like there, there can be like a spectrum of offerings that you're, you're also providing in addition to just the filing of, mm -hmm. of, the, no, of the market. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in my subscription model right now, you know, I offer like in the, in the lowest tier model right now, I, I offer two document reviews a month, one trademark clearance search. You know, one IP strategy call and then like 
like a certain percentage on discount on all substantive work in the future if you join on. So those are kind of like values that I'm offering, right? And then like, if you go up to your above, then you start seeing, you know, IP portfolio management, you know, you start seeing like monitoring services, you start getting a secure portal for all your company's legal documents, you know, you start getting like in-person strategy sessions, you know, how many per year, two or four, depending on the tier you go with, letters sent on your behalf per month. Right hours of legal research per month, litigation analysis, you know, all these things. Like, so, like I said, you know, you do enough competitor research, you try to, you see how, how you can provide value in the, in the subscription model. So you absolutely, there are ways you can provide right. that. Like I have a client right now who wants to do a trademark application, but at the same time wants to send out these cease and desist letters because there's someone using his trademark there. Well, there's multiple companies using his trademark. I'm not going to charge him per you know, cease and desist letter I send, I'm just going to draft one and I'm going to, you know, be able to charge them for that. Like, here you go, fill in the blank, send it to the person. Right. If it's for the same matter, but if it's for another, then we draft again. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. So for your, for your different tiers, I mean, mm -hmm. how, so like to give a little bit of background, like for myself, like I know that the market research shows for subscriptions, you, you want to give either two or three options. Cause if you give them one option, it's yes or no. <laughs> but mm -hmm. if you give them more than three, like at a time, then mm -hmm. they sort of, they're like, I don't know which one to pick because it's too many. But ha even having said that, like I have, I have seven tiers, like seven packages on my website, but I'm only showing the client two at a time based upon mm -hmm. which bucket they choose. Are you an individual? Here's two tiers for you. Are you a freelancer? Here's two tiers for you. Are you a business owner? Here's three tiers for you, right? So like, so I've separated that out into, so they're only seeing three at a time. And because I have three buckets, they're only seeing the three buckets at, right? So are you, which category do you fall into? One of three, right? So that's how I've decided to do it. So how have you decided to do it and why? You know, that's interesting. I actually only kept it at three tiers. I didn't think about it in a way like segmenting it based on like the person who I'm talking to, which, you know, that shows your, I guess, like experience in the is an aspect of like talking to a consumer, but I only have three tiers. So I feel like when the same thing, when you said, when you give people too many options, they get confused. It's like me going to a restaurant. I never, I, you know, I'm sure I know the cheesecake and the cheesecake factory is great. When you see 50 pages of I know for a fact you can't do all of this, you right. know, so I'm just not even going to do this. So sa same thing here. I just kept it at three cheers because I wanted to keep it simple. Right. Although, you know, I'm not necessarily sure how simple I kept it because there's then so many different offerings and you start listing. And then I want to, I, I want the client to have this opportunity to like ask questions, but also don't want them to get overwhelmed with the different offerings that I'm giving them. Now I want them to understand. So next to like each offering, I have like little descriptions that they can go over. But again, I don't know how much people are reading that, right? right. So I I do the I do the three tier because I think like choosing one of three is better. But you know I'm gonna start doing what you're doing is if an individual comes up, maybe I don't show them all three. Maybe I give them just the first, just the two, <laughs> and be like, hey, here you go. Which one do you want? Maybe maybe yeah. I mean you know because because we're figuring out how to do it as we go. All of the subscription mm -hmm. attorneys are. Yeah, and so I'm I'm looking at your website right now. It's Drishti Law. Am I saying Drishti that? Drishti Law. Yeah. Okay. Why Why Drishti? What does that mean? Drishti me means an intense, focused gaze. You know, okay. like you, you're you have it's vision with intent. You know, it's not just like you're you know sitting on your butt and you just got a vision. You're like you have an in, a vision with intent. I, like uh, I don't know. I just really I really liked. I wanted something to kind of like be representative of, of like what I think about the, what I, what I think about being an IP attorney and also like kind of related to some, what of my culture, because I could have just been like, you know, Malhotra LLC, you know, <laughs> like, or, I, I, or intense focus law, <laughs> intense focus law. I mean, I guess, I guess that would be great for clients to see like, at least he is intensely focused, but, <laughs> but yeah, the reason I, I came up with that name is to, it's kind of like, stay connected with you know, my background. And then also, you know, it ties in, you know, because just like, through, just like, you know, anything in life, everybody has drishti, everybody has a vision. Mm -hmm. And I am that attorney who helps them realize that vision. Yeah. And, and what I like about that name too, is for somebody who is from a different culture than you are, that also maybe kind of sounds like it could be someone's name. And so yeah. it, ha it has both 
both the sounding of a traditional law firm while at mm-hmm. the same time actually being something very unique and different, right? So you kind of get both yeah. both there. I also see you have something that I've also have on my website, which is a button that makes it really easy to book an appointment. And yes. so instead of instead of clients like calling in, trying to get someone on the phone, they could just click a button on your website on, on every page and boom, you got I a love call a good. Them. I love a good call to action. You know, I'm going through a website redesign right now and you'll actually see a new one in the next two to three weeks. And, you know, my whole focus throughout the, every call was like, whenever I'm scrolling through a page, it's like, I don't see a call to action. I don't see a call to action. I don't see a call to action. It's like, and that's very important. Like people need, it needs to be, and especially even when you're doing mobile sites, mm-hmm. right? Like, I just feel like people who are making websites uh, right now, or like people who've had websites for the law firms for the longest time, they still haven't gotten around to having good call to actions. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a good amount of like legacy law websites that don't have those because people just want to get in touch with you, you know, and they want to just like book an appointment, talk to an attorney. I, I have a question. Like right now, are you still doing like free consultations or do you like charge for your consultations? So I, I do free 15 mm-hmm. minute intro calls. I don't yeah. call them free consultations because guess what? It's only $20 a month to get legal advice from me. $20 a month. Try it out for $20 mm-hmm. and get me for the whole month, even if you yeah. unsubscribe. And, and so so I don't do free consultations. I do mm-hmm. free 15-minute introductory calls. Okay. And, and and so like your, I see you use Calendly too. So so on that page where it says Drishti Law one-on-one with you, mm-hmm. I also have a disclaimer in there that says, hey, this is, this is us just getting to know each other. There's no legal advice. This isn't a free consultation. You know, it's only twenty dollars a month if yeah. you want to sign up. This is just to make sure it's going to be a good fit, and so okay. I, so it's not a free consultation. But that's because my pricing is so so accessible, right? Yeah. So, so that, but but everyone does it differently. I'm on the I, I'm I say don't do free consultations because you can't give legal advice anyway unless they're a paying no. client unless you have an oh, engagement agreement. I, I think that's just like a, a going thing. Anytime I, I I guess like I should maybe reword that because I don't necessarily provide legal advice anyways. I'm not going to give away what I'm going to do for you before you actually pay me. So I don't necessarily include legal advice in my consultations as well. You know, like, like, like you said, we're learning as we go, you know, what my, what, how I deliver my service and how they look like today are going to be completely different of how I deliver them three months from now, because I'm already thinking about three months from now, what I want to implement into my law firm. Right, which you're able to do because you're not just focusing on billing your time because that's the only way you're making money to bring yeah. it back to the subscription model. But something else that you're doing, which you're able to do because you're not thinking about it in terms of, oh, shoot, if I'm not billing time, I'm not making money, is you're you're engaged in a lot of content creation. And since we first met, I subscribed to some of your stuff so I could see the content that you're putting out there, right? But I also see on your website, you even have a free ebook, which is part of content, right? So, yeah. so for first talk about the ebook and where that came from and then talk about your social media game. You know, the ebook was basically my website guy's idea. He's like, we're launching a website. Let's put together your like kind of like trademark basics into an ebook that you can just offer. Again, it's a resource. Mm-hmm. Most people, most people are searching for like free information. They're not, I mean, I, I think most people understand they're not going to get free legal advice, even though some people try to get free legal advice, <laughs> but you know, they want free information to make informed decisions. They want to hire an attorney who they can at least verify and knows something. It's gone other days where like, you know, I mean, maybe some it still exists in some communities, but gone other days where like, oh, I know this person. He's a solid attorney, you know, really great. And like word of mouth travels, but, you know, people still want to see how much information you're able to provide them before actually hiring you. So I think me making content you know i was very hesitant because i like to i like to say that i'm an internet clown because but you know because if you look if you look at my personal social media ex- like imprint it basically does not exist because i've made a concerted effort you know i, I deleted facebook that's one of the best mistakes I, I, not mistakes but that's one of the best decisions I, I made and that was like almost seven eight years ago But getting back on into like social media, being face forward, doing all those things was a little bit difficult initially. It's not easy. You know, if you looked at my videos from back last year in April, they're not great. You know, (laughs) 
I'm still not great, but you know, I feel much better when I'm much con con more confident when I'm like producing this content. And I think what it's really helped me, I'm starting to see the fruits of the labor now because people are start starting to reach me because of all the YouTube, Instagram content that I have made. And especially in the beginning of this year, there was like a switch because I changed some team, I changed my media content team. And then also I can't, I just like, you know, we weren't doing enough on Instagram basically. And I wanted to produce more there accessible content too. Nobody's going to sit there and make the five, like watch the five, seven minute videos that I make about intellectual property, 10 minute videos on intellectual property. But pe what people do want to hear about are the Nike suing bape or Toblerone having to change their logo on their chocolate, uh, their chocolate. And why did they have to do that? People want to hear about those things. So yeah, that's where the content strategy comes in. I want people to kind of relate to how IP is around you every day. You know, there's this book I read about logos and it was talking about how there's like a citation. And this was back in 2013 that Americans see over 16,000 ads per day which is crazy. But if you think about it, as soon as you wake up, you go into your bathroom, there's probably like 20 brands just like sitting right there. There's 20 ads. So my idea is to just to kind of like, you know, just reaffirm that to the consumer that your branding needs to be everywhere. Right. Right. I mean, just looking at my screen right now, right? You're wearing a hat with a logo on it. You're wearing mm -hmm. a shirt with a logo on it. I have... I have my logo on my background, and then I, I see Zoom meeting on the very top of this of the Zoom opening. To the right, I see all my tabs with all the logos. Right, you've mm -hmm. got you've got Amazon, you've got uh, Google. You know, yeah. I, I see the Adobe logo up. You know, like I'm seeing so many logos and advertising just staring at my screen right now. The Logitech next to my camera, it's everywhere. Yeah, and and the whole idea for me making that content is to show small business owners, creatives that IP is not just for the big players. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's for you too. If anything, it's to protect your creativity because if you, I can give you so many exa examples from so many different industries, I mean, fashion being one of the big ones, where like you know boutique owners and like small level fashion designers kind of get screwed over all the time because an H&M or a Forever 21 or a major brand or some rich person has, you know, Kim Kardashian has a lot of money and has a lot of resources and they're able to, you know, they're able to like co-opt a lot of these designs without, without having to pay for the designs they, you know, were inspired from or whatever from this like small business owner. In that scenario, I'm trying to tell this boutique owner that, hey, you have a brand that you can protect. You have designs that you can protect and you have access to these resources that you can. And whenever someone comes to me and says, I can't afford you, which is, you know, I'm comparatively to a lot of my competitors, you know, I'm not that expensive. But right. when people say that, I immediately tell them, hey, there's a lawyers for creative arts nonprofit in Chicago. Go to them. There's IP clinics all over the country. Go to them. There's free resources available. But please find a trademark attorney. Find an IP attorney because you need to protect what you have. Right, right. So we're running out of time, but I want to make sure I get a few more answers out of you. So kind of yeah. rapid fire here. Mm -hmm. what, what has been the feedback from your clients? You, I know you said most of it's flat fees, but for the ones mm -hmm. using the subscription model, what, what have they, what's been their opinion on it? I think one of my clients, she's very happy with the model, mostly because she didn't, she didn't want to just drop a lot of money from the get-go mm -hmm. and she's okay doing the once a month thing. Although, you know, there are times where it's very dependent. Like some clients want a lot of answers and then some clients are okay. You know, I'm giving the use of money. Uh, you're just done. But so far, you know, the feedback, it's not a moneymaker for me, but it's so far the feedback's been pretty good. But like right. I said, it's going to probably change the way I deliver it three months from now. Right. And it all balances out. Some clients will be more needy and some clients will be less needy. And I think mm -hmm. in, in the long run, it probably all balances out. Mm -hmm. As far as technology for like how you're actually powering the subscription and also just in general, like what are you using to make your practice more efficient because you're not billing your time? So technology wise, you know, like I'm using a lot of like automation tools. I mean, basically through like third party integrations like Zapier, everything from like, you know, the way I get paid to like, if someone hires me, how their, their contracts get immediately sent out to them. Like there's a lot of automation involved, basically. you know, I don't, I don't, I can't rattle off the name of every automation that I have built in, 
but most of them are through third-party integrations with Zapier. But yeah, no, that makes the practice a lot easier in that sense. You know, I, I wa- if I can automate it, I want to automate it. Yeah, yeah, here, here to that. I'm still looking for like a really good automation expert to set up a bunch of zaps for me. <laughs> if, you need, if you need someone, I can help you with that. <laughs> all right, all right. And then, but but like even like client portal wise, like are you using mm-hmm. like a Clio or a Practice Manager? Practice like, Panther. Practice Panther? Yeah. Okay, all right. And uh, and then any other kind of like legal tech that you're using off the top of your head? I mean, legal tech, you know, for research purposes, I, I do like Lexus, Nexus is the practice management side because it, it does provide a lot of resources, especially for content creation as well. You know, as much as people would like to think that we went to law school and just remember all the law all the time, <laughs> there is some research involved because I want to, you know, what is it? Trust, but verify. Yes. So on the, on the content side, also I'm using a lot of like tech, like, you know, there's blog writing tools that I'm using, you know, I'm, I write all my blogs, I write all my content, but I'm still getting some assistance from tools like Surfer SEO or, you know, yeah. Tools like that. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously Calendly, which we saw integrated yeah. with the website, right? And then for the last question, which is a little bit of a doozy, is um, I like to ask this of all my guests, if I can, if, if we have time for it, it's a really important one. The ABA collects data on the profession and publishes it. And that data has shown over the last several years that even though there's more women and more attorney and more people of color going to law school than ever before, that there's still a lack of leadership of the underrepresented groups in large law firms in general. And, uh, and at least having this podcast and interviewing attorneys who are being disruptive in the profession are, are the vast majority of them are women and, and the next big, largest group are attorneys of color. And so my question for you is, why do you think that is? And, and does it give you freedom that big law doesn't? I think it gives us freedom in the sense that we're able to make our own decisions and, and then also kind of carve out a path for ourselves because it is, you know, mostly a white male dominated industry. As I mentioned earlier, about 2% of all attorneys are South Asians. I think we have to be innovative. We have to be creative because we don't have, you know, generations of equity built into the industry. Mm-hmm. You know, when I, I don't have a name recognition. That's why when I say things like, you know, when I'm talking to family members about my business planning, when I start talking about SEO, search engine optimization, and start really getting into the weeds of law firm development, they look at me like I'm wearing a tinfoil hat. But, you know, I need to know those things because I am developing a law firm on the internet for the, like, for the internet. And it's way different than someone who's had a law firm for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, where they have, like, just a dearth of clients that on referrals that they can just survive. So if anything, people of color and especially women, they have to be innovative to kind of, like, stand out in the industry. We're almost asked to double the amount of effort and how good we are than like our count, our white male counterparts more often than not. So I think, you know, it's almost out of necessity that we have to be. And I, you know what, I think last year when I first started this, it was, it was a struggle, but I'm enjoying it right now. It's the last three, four months. It's, it's fun. I, I'm loving the business development part of it. If anything, I, I love thinking about how, more creative I can get in how I can deliver my services. Because if it makes it easier for my clients to get my services, I want to find every possible innovative solution to do that. Right. And a good innovator like you also comes up with a subscription model. So I think- yeah, we'll, end, we'll end on that one. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the subscription model. Yes. So last question I actually ask all my guests is, is a hot dog a sandwich and why? <laughs> Oh my God. I think I'm back in like sports class and law school again, but a hot dog, a sandwich, you know, I will say hot dog is a sandwich. We just got, it's got two slices, but actually I will say hot dog is a sub category of a sandwich Mm. because there are sub sandwiches. There are, you know, paninis, there are different kinds that you can consider sandwich. I mean, I would even argue a a burrito is a sandwich, Mm -hmm. but you know, we went to law school, so we could literally argue anything. (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I, I've, I've been waiting for an answer like that about yeah. the subcategories because I, I ask this of all my guests. And I don't always yeah. interview lawyers, yeah. but I've been, I've been waiting for, for an answer like that. You know, you put mind. it's like I'm thinking on the sense of like it's bread and there are things in between and it's the same concept. And then you're just creating subcategories of how fancy you're getting with it. 
<laughs> yeah, right, right. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, thanks again for, for coming on the show. If, if anyone wants to follow up with you, where's the best way for them to do that? They can go on my website, www.drishtilaw.com. That is D-R-I-S-S-T-I-L-A-W.com. They can find me on Instagram, Sahil Malhotra, IP. Same thing they can do on Twitter, Sahil Malhotra, IP. And on YouTube, Realize Your Vision. All right. All right. Links to all those in the show notes. Thanks again for coming on. Yes. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks again to 650 and Gavel for sponsoring this show. The best way for others to discover this show is for you to share it with someone you think would find value from it. Follow me on LinkedIn since that's where I'm most active on social media and click the bell towards the top right of my profile to get notified about all of my posts about this podcast and everything else I think is valuable for you to see. To get in touch, message me on LinkedIn or email kerbis at lawsubscribed.com. All links are in the show notes. Until next time, this is Matthew Kerbis with Law Subscribed.